and a very warm welcome to today's Under the Spotlight with the Product and Marketing Director and the CEO of Octopus Energy. My name is Sophie Devonshire and I'm the CEO of the Marketing Society and I am loving being part of this global network of progressive marketing leaders. And one of the things I'm enjoying most is the way in which we aim to share the stories and the ideas and the perspectives from different people and how they've gone through things from a marketing perspective. We know that as a network, when we come together, when we connect together, when we share ideas and work together, we can help each other do well in our careers. We can help each other do good in the world and in society, and we can help each other feel good about this incredible industry, about business, and about everything that's going on. And I particularly love our Under the Spotlight series because it's one of those experiences with people where we just ditch the PowerPoint and the formulaic ways of discussing things, but just hopefully have a very candid and open conversation with great marketing leaders where they can share their experiences. And in the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was most famous for being the wife of an American president, she said, we must learn from other people's mistakes because life is too short to make them all ourselves. We should also learn from other people's successes. And one of the reasons I'm so delighted to be introducing today's session is that it is a story of success and it's a story of super fast growth and one that's been fueled by great bravery and great marketing. It's also something I think you're going to find interesting because of the personalities of the people involved and their promise to talk honestly about their experience of taking octopus energy from nothing to being a business valued as a unicorn. Um, we are going to be talking today to two incredible people about what they've done. But before we introduce our speakers, I just want to say a proper hello to everybody. Um, I know a number of people have dialed in from around the world. One of the things I don't like so much about the way in which we do this is that I can't see you all and say a proper hello. Um, but what's great is that hopefully we can reach more people in this format. But if you'd like to, it would be great if you could make this an interactive and engaging session. We have the Zoom function, um, which allows us to chat and we've got Q&A there as well. So if you are there, people, come and say hello. I would love to ask you all to come onto the chat box and say hello. And I have a question for everybody listening before we get started on our discussion today. We are going to be talking about exceptional customer service. Can you please come and say hello on the chat box and tell me what brand do you most associate with exceptional customer service? Or have you had an experience recently where you've had an incredible customer service from a brand? Come onto the chat box and say hello. Let's see who's there and where you're dialing in from and if you've got any experiences to share around that. Hello, everybody. Hello, Jane. John Lewis. And why? What's, what's great about it? Hi, Annie. Um, just to everybody as well, if you've got uh, the opportunity to say something, come and try and type all panellists and attendees so that everybody can see your comment, otherwise we just see it. Welcome everybody, keep your comments coming. It's really good to see everybody dialing in from around the world. Uh, another London person, Richard, the question was, oh, hello, Richard. The question was, what brand do you associate with exceptional customer service? So James, Aqualisa and Worcester Bosch, excellent. Always very helpful, ready to help and give good advice. Anybody else come and say hello? Excellent. Never knowingly undersold strategy slick even during COVID, Jane. Interesting. I know they're about to move away from that. It's a difficult strategy. Hello from New York, Caroline. Great to see you there. A great experience at CarMax. CarMax, not CarMex. So the car one rather than lip balm, right? Um, majestic wine, Twickenham. Always good service. And why, Richard? What was so great about it? Come, come and tell us. Um, great to see that the brands you're mentioning. Please keep 
adding comments on that chat function as we go through. It's much more interesting for us. I know you're probably doing a few things at once, but it'd be lovely to hear what you think as we go through. Um, hello, Lucien. Nice to, to see you as well. Um, the questions and answers box is there as well. I would be surprised if you didn't have some questions for Greg and Rebecca today. Um, so please put your questions in that Q&A box as we go through, because there will be time at the end. I'm going to be asking a few questions, um, but there will be a time at the end for us to talk to our great speakers today. So keep the comments coming, keep the questions and answers coming. And I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the people we've got speaking today. So let's start with um, Rebecca. I'd like you to, to um, give a warm welcome as much as you can remotely to Rebecca Dibson, who is the Marketing and Product Director at Octopus Energy. So Rebecca works with a team of marketers, designers, and also uh, you know, product side of people to make sure that she is redefining what's possible for consumers and the UK energy system. So she focuses on technology, data, and great people to deliver the best of products and experience. And Rebecca comes from a utilities background. She was previously head of product at Centrica Funded Hive, taking it from a kickabout startup to a, the leading smart home provider in the UK. Rebecca is going to be joined in the conversation with her CEO and the founder of Octopus Energy. So Greg is a very experienced digital entrepreneur. And he's passionate about making the green energy revolution affordable through technology. He started his career in marketing in a classic uh, Procter & Gamble role, but has spent most of his career building and advising and investing in successful startups and um, digitally focused businesses. You've got, for example, his role in um, the e-commerce company C360, which was very successful. He built HomeServe's innovation business, and he's an angel investor in a wide range of tech startups, as well as serving as a director for a number of innovative businesses, including the great Zopa, the world's first peer-to-peer -peer lender. So he spent a lot of time looking at the digital sector, the technology sector, and then in 2015, he founded Octopus Energy. Octopus Energy entered a market which was one that had never been disrupted. It was a $25 billion sector in the UK, and it's worth $5 trillion globally. And in the last four and a half years, Octopus has dramatically changed the shape of the energy sector. They've been redefining what's possible in energy. What's really impressive about Octopus is it is a multi-award winning technology company, which has been innovated and campaigning towards a renewable future. And it's a brand that really stands for something. In the UK, Octopus now stands, I think, and I'm sure my guests will correct me if these numbers are wrong, 1.5 million customers, growing by 3,000 per day. And it's the only energy supplier who has been recommended by the Consumer Champions Witch for three years in a row. It is the UK's fastest growing private company. So I would like to introduce you all to a dynamic duo of speakers. Greg and Rebecca, come onto the screen, come and say hello. So brilliant to see you, and I hope you don't mind the gushing intro, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's going on. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, good. That was great. 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 Yeah, it wasn't gushing enough, Sophie. If you let me write my own. <laughs> we'll talk, we'll yeah. talk more about how brilliant you both are and about how brilliant the company is. But the idea today is for us to have just a bit of a chat between the three of us about what's happened, what's worked, what hasn't, the mistakes, how you're feeling about it all, and, and also how the two of you work together. Because I know for a number of our members and anybody in business, that dynamic between the marketing side of the business and how it drives growth and what's happening is always uh, particularly interesting. So Greg, this is all your fault, right? You started this. Let's start, can you tell us what made you decide to go into this ridiculously competitive world? Why did you start Octopus? Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, in all seriousness, thanks, Sophie. And um, the blushes are dying down, uh, but there may be some middle-aged redness there as well. Uh, look, this business uh, came about because uh, I and some uh, colleagues started a business that built uh, platforms 
in the early 2000s that helped companies go through the digital revolution. And we kind of had a front seat there as, you know, kind of lots of sectors digitized. And I think what you found in every single sector before digitization, all the incumbents would say, it's all well and good, you know, books going online, but it's never going to happen to clothes. People need to try it on. They go, oh, it's all well and good, books and clothes going online. But, you know, holidays won't go online. Uh, it's all well and good, those things. And, and, and so it went on. And every sector would have a reason why their sector was immune. Uh, now, by the time we sold that business, most sectors are digitized. <laughs> so, so we had to look around for which sectors are not yet digitized. And, um, you know, energy really stood out. Um, globally, uh, energy companies are, you know, kind of protected from competition by regulation. And so instead of them um, being forced by competition to become efficient and, and to drive great customer outcomes, um, they, they kind of got fat and, and, and their main customer might be the regulator or the government in any given market. And as customers, we saw the pain of that. I was sitting in the pub talking with some friends. I said, this is shit. I said, I'd, I'd just gone through a terrible experience with an energy company of all being there. By the way, I know that we're not perfect either, but I hope we're a lot better the vast majority of the time for the vast majority of customers. But, um, and I said to these mates, like, like you know, uh, it could be better. In any digital technology. Anyway, obviously my mates laughed and said, how can you ever take on the big six? Um, and I've got to be honest, I was actually slightly, um, you know, uh, what's the word? I, I wasn't brave enough. So I think it's around 2011 or 12. Um, I, I, along with a couple of colleagues, we found some students from LBS to help us write a business plan. Um, and it said we needed 10 million quid. And they kind of said, look, it looks like, yeah, it's a very competitive market, probably won't work. Um, and, and so I kind of put that business plan on the shelf. I was too embarrassed to go and raise 10 million quid off PowerPoint in a sector I'd never worked in. But I was lucky enough that in 2015, I, I met a guy called Simon Rogers, who's the founder of Octopus Group. Octopus Ventures is a well-known venture firm, but Octopus also actually have invested two and a half billion pounds in renewable generation. And when I met Simon, um, we got on really well. And I just spontaneously pitched him really and said, look, there's a business plan I've got to do something I think you should back. And um, he was intrigued. And I think it was like five weeks later, he backed the business. So, you know, I think what, what really came together for us was the digital revolution, the opportunity to use technology to drive down cost and improve customer service at the same time. And, you know, I joined Greenpeace when I was 16. And I think we all got sick of hearing these bloated energy companies blaming green taxes every time they put their prices up when we knew that they weren't as efficient as they could be. And so the opportunity to really take a front seat and driving renewable energy was a really kind of, uh, it, that's the kind of thing that we all want to be able to do with our careers and with our lives. So bringing all that together, um, you know, a, a bunch of us sat down in a room in Hammersmith and started a business. Uh, great place for things to start in Hammersmith. So it was from the customer, you know, your customer pain, seeing that was a problem there, um, a reaction against the fatness of, of what was going on. Um, and a little bit of a dose of bravery and serendipity and like-minded people coming together as well as a, a overall sense of purpose or wanting to actually make a difference but the combination of those things was the magic bit, bit of it all okay and um rebecca why why did you then fall in with this craziness and what made you want to get involved in it all <laughs> well i mean i was uh <clears throat> I was never going to work in marketing. I was going to be an accountant. Um, and then I was, I was uh, uh, sucked in, tempted, wooed by an incredible long copy ad uh, for the Ogilvy Graduate Scheme written by the great Rory Sutherland on the back of our, my university student magazine back in the day when I'd already accepted a job with KPMG, I think. Um, and ended up working in advertising at Ogilvy, which was fabulous. Um, and then from there moved to one of their clients who was British Gas. And I was at British Gas for, for, for some years in, in marketing and brands um, and then over in Hive building, building products. Um, and I didn't really, British Gas is, it was, a, was a great place to work, but um, you know, has, has its challenges. And I, I didn't, um, I wanted to kind of explore more, more avenues um, and looking around at uh, the different options available kind of octopus sort of fell into fell into my lap one day as a as a, as a really cool startup um, with an incredible tech platform and a, and a, and a great vision and um, I think um, Greg got my CV um, and one day I got an email from him saying, oh, I'd love, I'd love a chat with you. I've got some time today at 12 or, or next week. And I remember looking down at what I was wearing and I was like, right, wearing a dress. Okay, let's just do it now. 
um, and kind of an hour later we were having we were having a coffee because um, actually the, the Hive office was, was quite close to the Octopus office so um, and then I think by the end of the day I, I, I had a job um, because I was just I was bowled over really by the, the vision that Greg had for changing the energy industry for the better but also the team that he pulled together um, to enable him to do that and I think often um, you know, there's there's not many people in the world who can both kind of do the jazz hands and then build the jazz hands on a knowledge <laughs> of people and of teams and of great tech um, yeah. that actually going to make a difference. And I met, started to meet the CTO and, and the CFO and you know ops director and really understand that gosh, these were all this was a team of um, people leading in their field and wanted to do something different and actually they had the ability to to do it. Um, yeah. And it was a big it was a big jump for me moving from you know a British Gas um, middle management comfortable position to go and work at a startup um and people kind of went really um yeah, brave move. you know yeah it was a, it was it was a bit brave but it, fe it felt right it felt right i felt like i, I trusted the, these people um and that i would take that chance. interesting the mix then for you if there was something visionary and exciting there but also you did the the the, the reassurance and the rational thing of actually these people do know roughly what they're doing and, yeah. and putting it all together um yeah. and when you both had that first conversation over coffee and I love the fact it all happened so fast and there's clearly a sort of right let's make this happen for both of you um, when you had that conversation when you were talking about it from the start I mean how much did you talk about the importance of marketing full stop and what role that was going to play I mean I don't know Greg for you did you, right from the start were you thinking that marketing has a role to play and has I mean has it had a role to play I mean look I'm a marketer I'm a marketer and I, I, you know, when I started my career at Procter & Gamble, probably the same time as you, Sophie, roughly. Um, I remember reading Marketing Week and Marketing uh, Magazine every week. It was religious. Um, and I kind of saw here with people defining the brands that were defining society. And, um, uh, you know, it always surprised me uh, when I saw that quite a lot of companies were led by people who come from, for example, finance. And I was like, how do you understand customers? Like, you know, customers are the company. Um, now, by the way, there's a, you know, really important that we uh, absolutely build an organization of wonderful, happy people who are totally motivated by the same mission to deliver for customers. But, you know, that is a, uh, it's a marketing skill set. And I think to what Rebecca says, it's not about the jazz hands. It's about deeply understanding people and what they need, knowing how to communicate with them about it and knowing how to deliver it. And I think that combination, which, you know, kind of Rebecca's already started highlighting, um, kind of, for me, defines not only kind of what is magic about marketing, but what we were looking for in a marketing person. And Rebecca, I remember your CV, by the way. I also remember it actually came on my desk. I was supposed to send it to someone else. And when I had a look at it, I was like, I didn't actually, want to say that, but yeah, yeah, basically you kiboshed my opportunity at another job, didn't you really? I did, I did, I, I, I mugged it. The, the reason I did that, the reason I did that was there was a CV of someone who clearly had defined uh, customer experiences and brands in innovative spaces, but had also done the hard graft of understanding, you know, Rebecca, you might want to, I mean, one of the things you talked about in your interview was the 140 different communications that you wrote for British Gas right and I think you know that is as important as having a you know maybe more important than having you know a jazzy logo and a great media plan yeah 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 and I kind of I you know yes yeah, so so when I when I moved from from advertising to to, to British Gas one of the reasons I moved from advertising is I found it quite difficult to and um, not be able to d deliver great ideas all the way through um that you know you, you work in you get to work in a really trendy place with really awesome people and then kind of it gets to the client and the client kind of pairs away you know at uh, something that was brilliant when it was with you know an art director and a copywriter and then it gets through all the many layers of approvals and it's just this tiny unexciting shell of a shell of a thing so um so i, I moved to bush's gas and actually i was really <laughs> i really enjoyed you know thinking about you know how uh, how a company how a brand um what, what those touch points are um that you experience with the brand go you know kind of every day uh, and actually my first job was to pull together the suite of operational comms that British Gas sent to their letters their customers so all the letters that were sent because at that point it was still letters not not email and there were kind of yeah 140 different types sent hundreds of thousands of times a year by an enormous print center in Liverpool 
um, and they were sent by different parts of, of the country so and different parts of the company and different parts of the country and there wasn't any you know in different systems and there were kind of five different systems and some were sent from onshore and some were triggered offshore and it was just you know as a customer there was really kind of complicated different set of uh, of correspondence that, that you'd get and I really enjoyed kind of actually you know really thinking about how can you write a letter that someone doesn't really read because they just give yeah. and they go oh, okay fine you know I get that I get what it's telling me it's a really easy way of, of someone interacting with with your day rather than kind of thinking about and then I always from then always became you know fascinated with that how do you get you know how do you really become a smooth um part of your of your customers life something that they enjoy dealing with just because you make things you make things easier for them and it's not about a big fancy spending lots of money on a logo or an advertising campaign it's just about you know making their lives easier and if that's easier because they're there you're there when they they need you or if it's easier because actually you just you just keep things running in the background and they can self-serve or it's yeah. easy because you do something a little bit fun for them when they weren't expecting it then you know but it's thinking really really hard about that all of the time Yes, yeah, so, so, you know, properly starting with a customer, which everybody talks about, um, but actually it sounds like there's that granular detail of what everything we're doing, is it making it easier, is it making it more enjoyable, are we making them happier, you know, and, and doing that. So that focus on the customer experience and then related to that customer service has been there for you right from, from the start with Octopus Energy. I mean, has, has it been a pain to maintain? Uh, not just the customer thinking, but the, you know, making sure that that customer service level is high. How's that felt to, to keep that priority all the way through? Greg, Greg I mean, yeah. you, you start with, start, oh. yeah. you, 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 you're the one pushing it, and then Rebecca, I guess, is making it happen. I mean, how, how, how's that working? Yeah, I'm not sure I do push it, actually. I, mean, I think there are a couple of interesting things. So first of all, the opportunity to create an organization from scratch means you can do all the things that people read about in books, like, you know, you read about, you know, Daniel Pink stuff on, on Drive. Uh, you read about upside down organizations, decentralization, democratization. They're all buzzwords. But actually underneath it, there are some tremendously powerful ideas that are hard to implement in legacy organizations. Although, by the way, that shouldn't stop you trying. Building from scratch, we've been able to build upside down from the beginning. And, and I think, um, it, for example, I, I was fascinated in the chat panel, how many of the great customer brands weren't well-known brands. They were local yeah. service providers, right? Um, so, for example, one thing we did organizationally very early on was uh, instead of having a kind of mass um, you know, call center and things like that, we have tiny teams, uh, 10 people in an operations team, and those 10 people look after every aspect of the customer's um, life cycle with us. So they will answer the phone, but they'll also um, answer emails, but they'll also fix the issues that people will call about in the first place or preempt them by driving proactive work among their customer base. Now, those teams each look after 60 or 70,000 customers. As their customer base grows, the team splits. Um, but what that get does is creates lots, you know, we must have 35, I know, maybe more of these teams. Mm -hmm. um, and they uh, mean that... Um, a bit like a small business, you've got a small team who are responsible for every aspect of, of the service. Um, they're very little in the way of policies and procedures. They can make decisions exactly the way that your local dry cleaner, uh, you know, or carry house or, you know, others do. And um, it's really interesting because the tendency of companies is to want to standardize, to roll out best practice, but that just kills motivation. It kills the desire to deliver a great service. It kills ownership. Yeah. Uh, but it also kills innovation. Now, what we've got is all these teams do things slightly differently and all the results are available. The teams that, you know, where they try something that works, brilliant. Others may choose to adopt that. Um, but, you know, teams try something that doesn't work. It doesn't matter. I'm glad they tried it. And, and there is, you know, that, that, that is how we deliver customer operations. But um, I'd love to share you with our Slack. I was thinking about sharing my screen, but there might be some sensitive stuff. But um, <laughs> Rebecca, you're talking about the comms channel in Slack, which I think is the most powerful thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a secret, by the way. So you know, um, <laughs> yeah. British Gas so, X will be copying this, I'm sure. So, uh, so practically, there are there are there are things that we do to kind of keep that that customer focus, especially at kind of at a really senior level. So we use Slack to communicate with each other across the business, um, and we have a comms channel on Slack where anybody in the business. So we've got nearly a thousand people, about 600, 700 of them deal with customers, the majority. Um, and anyone can put in a suggestion or a thought or a, you know, a customer, uh, you know, a, a customer build on on the communications going out website email. Could we do this? Could we do that? That's not very clear. 
Um, and, um, and people kind of self-manage that. So people know that, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's customer problem, they've got other ways to go. It's not a kind of, you know, ask for help. It's more of a, oh, I've seen this email. And actually, I think that if we worded this email that way, then actually it would be clear for people and they wouldn't have to contact us. And every single message in, in the, so we could maybe get kind of a dozen or, or, or so a day, some, sometimes more. And I look at every single one of those, like all the time. So when it comes in, and so do other senior members of my team. So all of my team are on there and we all kind of keep an eye on it. And then someone will go, oh, hang on, that's something I can deal with. So for example, someone might spot an, an error somewhere on our, on our website. And because the front end development team work with me, they're in that channel. And actually you'll find a front end developer will just go, oh, okay, I'll just pick that up. I'll just change it now. So sometimes before I've even seen it, actually someone's gone, oh, okay, I've fixed it. Um, but actually it's, it's, it's about that kind of, you know, um, having that channel of everyone in the business to talk to anyone in the business and flag things that could be made better and self-managing that a bit so like I said we don't get bombarded by it but actually people are smart people who work yeah. for smart they're generally smart and they're empowered and they actually know what's a helpful thing to put in and what's not a helpful thing that's to put in and my team know the same um, and that's incredibly powerful and, and, and also the thing that we do is that um, all, everyone in the business looks after customers so I answer emails from customers every day. So we've sent out thousands of, uh, of emails this week because we've dropped some of our prices. Um, and the emails went out. Usually the emails, that when, we, when, we, when we move prices, when we drop prices, they come out from our, our CFO, Stuart. But actually this, this time we've put the whole management team on there, in, including myself. Um, and we always do that. So there's actually a named person that it comes from. And when you reply, it goes back to a person as well. Now, we don't all, you know, respond to the ones that come back. But I've... Um, I've kept an eye on all of the responses and answered a few myself because it gives you a really good sense of what questions are coming out there. So actually we've offered a particularly good fixed tariff for people who, who might want to fix their prices. And actually by seeing what people, how people are replying to the email, it means I can go, oh, actually, before we send the next batch of emails out, let's tweet that line. And then we won't have those questions anymore. So actually it's about, it's not about marketing doing something and then throwing it over the fence for customer services to, to look after. It's actually thinking about the business holistically, that how can we grow and how can we help customers and how can we reduce inbound by actually, it's, that's, it's not, this is my job and that's your job, but it's everybody's job to look after yeah. customers. And, and that's, you know, radical. I, mean, I want to unpick that because there's so many good things in there, I think, which are relevant for people listening as well, because, you know, that is a, it's the sort of thing that everybody talks about um, in terms of let's make sure that the person who's closest to the code, the closest, closest to the customer, closest to whatever is the person that helps um, bring ideas in, but you've structured it so that there is, um, you know, a, a speed in how everybody can share those ideas and those suggestions. It's motivating them because of course they all have the power for it all. But I think there's a fundamental um, point you've talked about there, which is everybody is responsible for the customer being happy and everybody's responsible for the customer. And of course, you know, there's always that question, I think, with um, startups versus big companies where, um, you know, big companies go, oh, actually, it's so much easier for a startup because they can shape it from, from scratch. But it's actually harder in lots of ways because you have got to shape it from scratch and you may have less resources to do it. But you've gone right from, from day one. This is going to be in our structure. We're going to make it as easy as possible. So then marketing is not a function. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a let's make sure we're listening and connecting everything up to get the, the speed happening. Um, but then, I mean, it's hard, hard for you both because then you're both also, you know, everybody is then responsible, but, but it probably speeds up your decision making as a team because ultimately you're going back to what the customer's saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, would you, would you change anything about that? Would you, would, I mean, you're both sounding quite energized by that as a, as a culture. Uh, it sounds like it's working. Yeah, I mean, like, like, oh, sorry, Rebecca. No, I think, I mean, you know, for me, yeah, marketing's not a function. Marketing grows businesses. Um, and actually marketing, and I, I hope there's, there's kind of you no know, finance people on here or anyone outside of marketing. I'm assuming this is a safe space. Um, <laughs> so, you know, marketing grows businesses and listens to customers and then develops products that customers would like. And then, you know, kind of finance follows, uh, making sure that, you know, there is the, the funds available to grow that business by doing things that, that customers like. Um, and that actually in that, you know, marketing was, it, it was what, growing, the, growing the business talking to customers, engaging with customers just as much as an operations person should, you know, they're not doing, people are not doing their job properly if they're not, if they're not talking to customers. And that's also, that's not, that's not, that's not focus groups. That's not, you know, bringing in safe customers for me in, and kind of talking, talking to them in, in a safe environment for people who like going to focus groups. Although sometimes those things can be used. It's actually like day in, day out, you know, responding to customers 
as not Rebecca marketing director, but as, you know, dealing with the query and look after someone and, you know, as Rebecca, um, just so you know, you know, where, where they're coming from uh, and what you can improve. And that's really important as well. But I mean, there's for both of you that, you know, I think there is a bravery involved in that as well, right? Because I think there are plenty of organizations where whatever role you're in, you hide away from the customer because they complain and they're, you know, they're, they've got things to say. And, you know, actually, isn't it a bit easier if you just ignore that and just get on with what you're wanting to do? Oh, you know so what, Sophie? Yeah, no, it's so funny. I, I, I contrast this with um, what I learned at Procter & Gamble, right? And by the way, we... A lot of these things we learned very early on. So when we first started doing sort of um, marketing, which is the social media, we did PNG style broadcast. And fucking hell, customers let us know very quickly that, um, uh, you know, that, that wasn't appropriate. Um, and we learned to listen. And I think very quickly what we realized is, you know, I love PNG, but I learned so much there. So really clearly, I'm really contrasting rather than criticizing. But the, um, the organization acts like a, it's the wall of a castle designed to defend anyone internally from ever dealing with anyone externally, customers or otherwise, by the way, right? Whereas um, I think what we tried to create was what we call the porous organization. So the job of, for example, customer operations people is they're rooting customer learnings to the right people internally. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's like the tube map showing how, you know, an issue with a, or a thought about our app might end up you know, immediately with the person who builds the app and they'll reply directly to the customer. And that creates this sense of ownership and responsibility that's far greater than any amount of sort of, you know, briefs and documented learnings. And it's interesting, I don't think we've ever run a focus group actually, have we, Rebecca? No. I just go, sometimes I go out and I go and ask people stuff. Have been known to yeah. do that. I usually out of the office and go and stop people and go, you know, can I show you this? But, but no. I, I think, I personally, I think, have, have answered around 30,000 customer emails since we started. Um, I don't do as many at the moment because we're, we're it's, it's getting hard. But, but you will though, it, when, yeah. when I've done more than you, you will get competitive because I, I am aware of your total and I am nearly there and I joined a year after you. So, <laughs> just, sorry, no back with that. <laughs> and I think like, yeah, but, but I think that does mean you're kind of turbocharging your real world customer experience when you're, you know, not just marketing, but every decision you're making in the business is customer informed. Um, so, you know, and I, I'd really, encourage people it's really brave when you first start doing it after you've been through sort of blue chip marketing training you start having this different approach to it it's it's, it's challenging um and you feel quite vulnerable and it feels like you know normally you've got experts um and suddenly you are the expert but actually once you've started it's so much more empowering for us too i think as leaders rebecca is that yeah absolutely well it, yeah it is a bit scary um you know and when you people come into into my team like developers or designers and you're like like go and you know answer some customer emails and people are actually going out some customer emails and I'm like they're just humans you, you know, they're, they're humans like anyone else they're not more scary it's kind of really you think well what if I don't know the answer and I'm like oh, okay well you say you go find it out you know yeah. and of course it's you and you're connected and there's something there by the way then the, the chat there's, there's people bloody loving the term porous organization a lot of support for the idea of a porous organization um, and I'm interested I mean it's just been such a journey for you both right and you know Greg, I've seen you go through all this and there's been things you've been building internally and connecting with the customer. But in the last however long, there's also been such a huge amount of external recognition for this journey you've, you've gone on. I'm curious because I'm looking at this list of awards, right? Which recommended provider 2020, you switch supplier of the year, winner 2020, REA company of the year, winner 2019, all these awards, you know, the, the financial recognition, the number of customers, what has been What's felt particularly good for you? What are you both most proud of in terms of how people are now externally seeing the, the success of what you've done with this as a culture and as a business? Greg, do you want to start with that so I can just go and wave because the lights have gone off in the meeting room. So just, just you know, That's very, teamwork, teamwork, because that works. Yeah, which very energy good, efficient. Greg? Well, it's interesting. Actually, I don't think those external plaudits are as meaningful to us as a couple of the things we've, we've the, the, the two most, the two proudest things about this business um, are the role we played in bringing about the energy price cap. Um, energy pricing, like so many sectors where you have a direct debit payment, has really, on the whole, um, optimized towards exploiting customer, um, customers who are unaware of how pricing works and the opacity of it. Um, so we see in insurance now, for example, the CMA or FCA have just said that insurance 
as of the end of next year, insurance companies are going to have to give you um, a renewal quote that's the same as they would give you as a new customer. Now that, you know, it is a sea change in the way that pricing works in these kind of direct debit industries. And I think it started here in energy when we, we lobbied so hard for the energy price cap. And we did so when we found the extent to which customers were being exploited by pre-programmed price hike. By the way, I don't, I don't blame anybody who's involved in that world because once you're in it, you optimize and you can't, it's so hard to escape from. But the change that we brought about there, I think made 11 million households in the UK better off on a yearly basis. So over a billion pounds back to customers and typically back to ones who need it most. That was proud of anything we've achieved in turn there, I think. I think the second thing is um, when we uh, took investment um, and all of our team are shareholders. And I think actually every single full-time employee is a shareholder. In fact, every time, you know, permanent employee, not full-time. Um, and I noticed one of the questions, the Q&A box is how does the role of reward and recognition work? And I think there's nothing more important than people genuinely having a potentially very valuable stake in what they're creating. Um, it's like Mrs. Thatcher created the sort of, you know, the idea of a homeowning economy. So you had a stake in society. And I think, you know, a business owning economy where you have a stake in the thing you're building um, is incredibly important. And, and when we did that, it enabled people to see that, um, when we had that uh, investment, to see that the equity wasn't just a piece of paper, it was meaningful and potentially life-changing. And we had a Zoom call in which five or 600 people got together at eight in the morning to be told about the investment. Amazing. And yeah, and when they saw what it would mean for them and, and we enabled people to sell a chunk of their shares at that point, it was life-changing for hundreds of people. And um, for me, that was like a, a, an incredibly proud moment because I think often in jobs like ours, you make promises and when you see them being fulfilled and you're, you're rewarding the faith people have paid in you, there is nothing stronger. Very nice. And it's, it's interesting. I think I can answer a couple of the, the, the questions in the chat panel as well. So um, uh, one of the, the key things about us as, as a business is, is our tech. So we have a unique tech platform um, which unlocks cheaper, greener power. Basically, it's a CRM and billing system, billing system, but it also works all the way through the great, um, the, the energy system to kind of change the way you buy and sell energy uh, as well. And last year, we were awarded by the Renewable Energy Association, who are the company that's done the most to drive uh, UK renewables. And I think that's my most, like, my proudest accolade because actually, this is about taking our technology, which um, allows us to offer cheaper, 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 greener power when there's when there's more greener power on the grid to 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 the world really. Um, and actually, that tech that we have is it's an incredibly good platform where all uh, customer management is on place, all data is in one place, all our AI and our machine learning, everything is is in one place. And actually, our operating model and the people in that poorest organisation work kind of hand in hand with the technology because you have incredibly empowered, smart people who know they can share their thoughts and their knowledge across the business, but actually empowered by very, very awesome tech, um, which means that our, our, our agents all have um, one customer view. And actually, when you call up 95% of the time, the person who answered the phone will be able to deal with everything, that you, anything you queried about. So there's no more passing you around IVRs. So actually, um, you know, we are a green energy company like like Inova or, or a bulb, for example, but actually that technology platform um, actually means we can offer offer something very different and actually are always going to be in a, in a more streamlined place than someone working on a number of different systems. I'm, I'm like just very quickly illustrate yeah. something there. Like, I need like, a bit of theatre for you, but you were it not for COVID, this office would be, you know, full. Buzzing. I, I just walked about 10 metres from my desk. And the guys who sit behind me, there's a bunch there now, but not as many as usual, um, are customer operations people. And they're talking to customers. And, you know, so many companies will put customer operations in a call center on the outskirts of a town or worse, in another continent of the time zone with people who've never lived it. These guys here are people who speak to our customers. They walk past my desk all day, every day. Because when we say we put the customer at the heart of the business, we absolutely do. And I think our CFO and I and Rebecca and our ops director is just there all sit among the people that talk to customers all the time. I think that really makes a difference. And uh, very briefly talked about, you know, role of recognition and reward. So I don't know if you can see this, but that's the big screen in our office. Yeah, hi, and, smiley faces. Yeah, so every time someone deals with us, they get asked to rate, you know, how good the service was. 
and a smiley face, quite a frowny, and it's live in real time. So it's there on the big and screen. Quick. All they have to do is do a, a smiley face or, or not, right? Yeah. It's not a long, complicated focus group or a feedback thing, but you've got the visual. Okay. Cool. Um, anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there, Sophie. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm loving it. obviously loving all, all this. Um, but what's, what's particularly interesting, I think, is one of the things we talk about when we talk about our marketing society members is the, when we're at our best as a group of members and, and what we tend to like is people who make an impact and make a difference. And both of you have just talked about what was most inspiring for you being times, you know, what you've done to actually make a difference. I want to ask, though, you know, it's still very easy at this stage you know, to talk about the success and how easy, and, you know, everything looks, looks so straightforward when you've got to the stage you're at. What's been the hardest moment? You know, is it ha you know, has it been related to marketing? Has it just been related to you know what's been like for you personally going through all this? What's been the, the hard bit? Um, Rebecca, for you, I mean, obviously working with Greg is terribly, terribly hard. As I can, yes, you're sharing with everybody. You know, what what has been the hardest moment for you coming into this and getting? Through I mean, it? I mean it, he, he's an entrepreneur. It's funny actually. Before I, before I, I accepted the job, which as it was all done in one day, I did have a couple of conversations with people. What do you think? And they were like. And, and I remember one, one lady, he was like, said, uh, sometimes working for entrepreneurs is hard because they're slightly mental. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm like, okay, okay. I, I felt I could take that um, and I have, so that's fine. Um, what's been the hardest thing? I mean, actually, I still worry that we're not growing kind of fast enough. Like actually, you know, can we, can we keep going at this incredible pace that every time, how can we keep to keep besting what we've done already? Um, and what's, you know, how are we striving for the next and we've delivered X and Y and Z and here we are and actually I want to take what we're doing to more people and more people around the world um, and actually are we moving fast enough and, and how you can, you know, um, we're looking at the likes of you know, Amazon and, and, and Uber in our sites and, um, you know, and are, are we in the best place to be able to be the, the biggest global energy disruptor? Um, and that's kind of just me out. And I'm a, pretty, I'm a pretty driven person, so I kind of worry slightly that I'll, I'll never be satisfied. I'll always, I'll always want, want more and, you know, want that next level. But um, that's, that's kind of fun as well. The challenge for all. And then, and Greg, you know, I don't think the pace scares you. Um, what's been the hardest moment? It's interesting because James Davis asked what's the difficult decisions as well, right? And I think uh, I, we are so privileged. We haven't yet had those truly awful moments that we know are going to come and actually quite often I have to say to the team like literally enjoy every minute now because sooner or later uh you know we will get slammed by something truly awful you know uh, look we we install meters right there's every chance at some point statistically that despite incredible training and processes one of our engineers might install one badly and it, it blows a house up right you know things things will go badly wrong um but actually the most difficult decision I absolutely can talk about, which is uh, it was the decision to acquire a company called Irisa had gone bust. And it was the worst run company in energy. It was, it, it was something like 10% of its customers were the ombudsman. Um, and it was an absolute catastrophic shit show. Um, and at the time, it was about a third the size of our company. So in acquiring it, we overnight had to somehow scale up to handle a third or 50% or whatever, more customers. And they'd had the worst journey in energy. But what we knew is if we got that right, it would be a signpost that, you know, uh, we could do the impossible and would make us a natural acquirer of other businesses. But if we got it wrong, you know, it wouldn't have bet the company, but it would have destroyed our reputation and set us back a couple of years. Uh, so that was the hardest. Acquiring Co-op Energy was the second hardest, by the way. Because, <laughs> again, it was a very big acquisition. And in that case, massive transformation program. They were on three separate platforms. We had to migrate all of those. And we do that without a program management office and all those things. But, um, you know, in both cases, I'd say, you know, and indeed like starting the business in the first place, fortune does favor the brave. Um, and, um, you know, you can spend forever worrying about what could go wrong. You're far better off, you know, like, you know, Jeff Bezos says, you know, most decisions are recoverable if you get them wrong. Yeah, the one well, the ones that are, are two-way doors he talks about, and then yeah, that's a bit so. easier. But you, you know, you guys have taken some pretty bold uh, decisions, and that's both energising, but but also, you know, this is not this is not a world for the faint-hearted. <laughs> if you are wanting to be as fast growth and as ambitious as, as you both are, um, I'm conscious there are lots of people who are wanting to ask questions. So I know in a second we're going to bring on other people's voices, but I think there's a 
Um, you know, just one last question for me, just on the marketing side of it all. Um, what's interesting when you both talk is there's clearly such a connected, joined up approach to it all. And I think great marketers by their very nature are the ones that connect up the silos and connect up bits of the, uh, the business. Um, a lot of our members are always talking about, you know, what is the future of marketing and business? What role should it play? You know, how can we make sure people understand that it is important if we think it's important? Any sort of final thoughts for you on, on the role of marketing moving forward and how important you think it is in business? Who wants to go first? Sorry, I mean, yeah, I, I, Sorry, I, was, I was writing an answer for someone, so Greg, go first. <laughs> serious, we'll, bring, just like... we'll bring them on and you can answer their questions as well. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm like just having it. Yeah, sorry, come on, carry on. No, look, I, I think, um, uh, there's an incredible video of a sales trainer in the USA on YouTube uh, and he has a room full of salespeople and um, massive hall and he says to them like who here is proud to be a salesperson and about half the hands go up and he says who here realizes that if it wasn't for salespeople America wouldn't be the country it is today right but it's about 20 years old there's a couple of observations culturally might you know kind of re reassess these days but he then says look in every town before they built the town there was a salesperson sold the railway all right in every town a salesperson got there and sold the wood to the people that were building the buildings and i think um you know he was kind of right that um commercial functions truly drive society and i think marketing is the most powerful function right because you have the ability to define um, a sector of product or service in ways which other people don't realize you're doing. And I saw someone tweeting yesterday saying, um, has anyone ever actually bought a product that saw an advert? <laughs> well, you know, there's a reason we spend so much money on advertising, right? It's not just advertising, it's the de definition, it's true. And, and it's, it's going beyond asking people what they want because you have to truly understand what they would want if you put it in front of them. It's cr imagining a different world and then creating it. By the way, I think this comes like so many other ninja powers. It's like, look, I, I almost had hypnotherapy to treat me for, for fear of flying. Hypnosis is also used to entertain and, and um, you know, uh, to, to ridicule people on stage. So with that great power, you can use it in different ways. It's the same with the power of marketing. We can use it to drive the most positive change in society, to create the world we need, to literally create, create you know, to help combat things like climate change and poverty. Or we can use it to flog stuff that, you know, we're, you know, we might not be so proud of. Now, by the way, there is nothing wrong with marketing enjoyable, entertaining things. You know, look, I love chocolate. <laughs> it's great that people market and create better chocolates. And by the way, I've got some ideas if anyone's here from a chocolate company on some great new products. But, but the point really being like, you know, we continue to have this choice on how we're going to define society. And that power sits in the hands of marketers more than anyone else. Um, so there you go. I, I don't think there's anything more important. The choices that people make and the power it gives. Uh, Rebecca, anything to add in defence of marketing or about how you're feeling ab about it as an industry, having you know made that choice to not uh, be an accountant? <laughs> So, yeah, this is really interesting. And actually, I think I can kind of slightly answer one of the questions by, by David uh, as well. So um, as a business, so we're as a green energy company driven by some awesome technology, which actually is taking, uh, is changing the, the energy system as we move towards a more renewable energy system. So our technology unlocks greener power and will enable people to use more power when there's more green energy on the grid and it's cheaper. Um, and kind of 20% of, of what I do is, is working on some really um, kind of innovative, dynamic, smart tariffs with, uh, um, so, you know, where tariffs where uh, you can get ridic you know, ridiculously cheap power if you shift when you use power to different times into the day, but to times where there's more power and there's lower demand. And so the price is cheaper. Um, and actually that bunch of people are kind of, in, you know, early, who are on those towers are kind of early adopters, techie types with our EVs, all that kind of thing. And in that place, I am building propositions for customers. So they don't know what they want, but I'm creating those propositions for, for customers. But actually 80% of what I do is, is mass market, understanding humans and what, what humans want from their energy company, which generally is they put you, you put the light switch on 
and power comes on and it's cheap and if it's green that's nice um, and the customer service is excellent and actually people do really respond to kind of elements of, of random joy that we like to intersperse in into the journey so it's kind of in that way it's it's listening to people actually what can you do better and what can you improve but even within that people don't always know what we want what what they want and actually people would say that energy is energy is boring and actually how can you create a brand around around energy and i'd argue that a, a brand is a choice and a, and a, and a commitment to be engaging with other humans who have a product that you want to take and actually there's no more choice um it's, it, there's no more reason for a, i don't know a particular brand of t-shirts to be okay. something you engage with than the uh, something that is generally the second highest cost that your household has after after your mortgage and actually if you think hard about what you can do to make it fun so for example we have our wheel of fortune and when you submit a meter reading every month which is a really important thing to do in energy so you stay on top of your bills you get to spin a wheel of fortune and win credit on your account and it's incredibly popular with customers we've had millions and millions of spins because people just like that slight gamification of something that's otherwise a man mundane task and um, very occasionally it goes down we have a bug in it and we get massive complaints on twitter because the wheel of fortune has gone down and people are like it's a you know it's a trick it's a trick so it's actually about thinking how can you you know understand you know be really talking to people about what what they want and what creates what is a great experience to have with a with a brand that, that you love and i i love that the, the emphasis in terms of experience you, know, you talked about it right at the start you know it's how we make it really really easy and of course anyone who's in tech has always talked about friction free and let's make it as easy as possible but also the the joy and the positivity and the uh, enjoying the experience which you know in a fairly prosaic category for lots of people you know the, you've, the fun you've there cre you've created and I think Rebecca the when you talk to the start of that you talk about the propositions and the side of it all I mean that's one of the things you know great marketers aren't just creative they are commercial and bringing that together and the, the fact that actually the difference between marketing and advertising is it is more than communications it's actually from start to, to end I think there's there's so much in there I'm conscious I want to ask lots more questions to you both but there's lots of people who want to ask something so I'm just going um, to call on somebody to come and show their face so you can see that there are other people here other than me um, Andy and see do you want to come and show your face and ask these guys a question um, and yeah, you can see, every, oh look, there's the, uh, a personal customer there, uh, Joe Schitz likes the Wheel of Fortune, it makes her smile every month, I love that. Um, Andy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, can you hear Hello. me? You can see yeah. me. Um, just a quick question, just right at the start are of Are you your... naked? Can you not show yourself? No, I can, I don't know why it's not, hold on one second. Is there, there we go. Hi, um, uh, hello. Um, just a quick question, when you were right at the start of that journey, and obviously you now you're really, really good at listening and understanding your customers. But how did you build that insight when you were right at the start and you didn't have the resources or the ability to do it at scale? And what are the learnings here for other startups to really, really be customer centric when they haven't got the resources to really understand customers right at the start? And, and that process of innovation that starts with really understanding your customers. I mean, so I, very briefly, I think we made our guess, best guess based upon our own experiences of what we didn't like about what we'd seen before and what we thought we might like. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's not building it for yourself, but it is basically building it for yourself and the people you know or you can imagine. Uh, but the magic, I think, is that you then iterate very rapidly based upon the feedback you get. So and when I say feedback, it's like literally build it, see how people are using it, see what they're saying when they phone us or email in or when they complain online or when they praise online. And then rapidly iterate. So and it's design funny. thinking, design thinking type innovation. Yeah, it's in market, very rapid in market evolution, right? So, yeah. and there was loads we got wrong, by the way. But, <laughs> you know, you find out in the real world when people are really buying with real money, I think far more easier than you do when you, you what I was used to do in, in my old kind of more corporate world. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Brilliant. Um, and, uh, David, are you there as well? Do you want to just add your question in, into this as well? Is he there? David, David. Oh, I think I kind of, I kind of covered. Um, yeah, you've answered a little I bit. I covered that. I wonder if I could answer and um, yes, not Steve. Sorry. Can I answer Steve's? Oh, sorry, David. We can, there. Is Steve there? Oh. And he's on mute. It's a classic. <laughs> 
thank you for your question, David. Is, is Steve, Steve, are you there to come and say hello as well? Join the group of us on, on stage. I've, I've, I've got a, a one more question for you guys as well while we're waiting for Steve. Sorry, throw, throw and I would love to answer David's question. David, you want to ask that but like out loud? And you're on mute a second ago, but... Yeah, you, you gave a great rendition about the porous and the organisation that's listening to customers and responding to customers' needs because they think they know what they want. But you're trying to push a very particular solution and getting the balance of that, right, of what you push and what you pull. How do you set that balance so that you, you keep all those that want to come to you naturally, but you draw in others? That, that balance is quite difficult, I think, to pick, really, particularly when you're doing it over very large numbers of customers. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think that there are probably two or three strands to it. And the first one is the most important stuff we do from a uh, mission perspective is not what customers are asking for, not what any of them know they want, but what we think the world should look like. And we build that. So for example, we've got a whole load of energy tariffs uh, that vary every half hour or that um, enable cheap electric vehicle charging. They come with complex APIs um, and, and often quite quirky user experiences while we're trialing them. But they, in a few years' time, are going to be essential for the world to benefit from cheap green electrons when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining. Now, we create those today long before anyone knows they want them in order we can find out you know, kind of what works for people, what doesn't, and so on. So that's our leadership. And then I often say to the, to the, um, you know, kind of the board or the investors, we invest in physics, right? So the government has got a whole load of ways in which they've built a regulated market. And, and that is the bulk of our business, 95% all of our revenue. But all of the future comes on the stuff that sits outside of that, where we're saying, look, we think physics is going to lead to a different world. And we need to start building for that world now to make it real. And the interesting thing is we can then take what we're learning there and take it to regulators, take it to the government, take it to governments around the world and say, hey, look, if energy worked in a different way, we could bring more green generation faster and cheaper and people will love it, not hate it. So to me, I think, you know, we're a leadership business, but actually 95% or 99% of what you see and what you buy from us is vanilla. And by the way, not villa, it's fucking great vanilla. Let's be really clear. Um, I mean, this is, this is Ben and Jerry's vanilla and I don't mean on the politics. I, I, I mean, uh, it's the, the point really being that we want to do the stuff that other people do better for customers in every way whilst creating a new world no, thank you yes that balance you you're obviously absolutely driven by that balance and it's very clear from the conversation today and all your background material and it just works really well thank you brilliant and thank you david um just time for one more quick question steve are you still there yeah. you know, last yes. quick question to, to greg and, and rebecca if, if i'm the right steve <laughs> You look, you look, you look, uh, you've got a question, right? And it's an interesting question. Ask away. Yeah, I mean, I think it was just, it was a, a, a slight kind of, uh, slight kind of uh, change there to what you were talking about. Um, it's more, more back to kind of the way marketing is going, uh, you know, and, and do you, do you see a, a, a need for your more traditional agencies with a lot of larger agencies, uh, so a lot of larger companies bringing their own marketing in-house, their own marketing kind of teams and creatives in-house within their own business um you know is there is there still a perceived value that we get from doing that as opposed to your older traditional agency model if you like what should be interested to see what your thoughts on that that are and how you see that going in the future so i i think i'll take that one um i have seen it's tricky because i'm aware there's probably a mix of, of of people on this call i have seen um mark agencies marketing in-house work and it not work um, and it always seems very tempting when you're paying a lot of agencies to go oh, just do it all all in-house but actually what's very difficult is if you're um, established and structured around bringing in experts because you do need experts experts in their space you can't have everyone internal um, it's it's very difficult to change your model now we do all of our marketing in-house we do our so my team is kind of is designers and writers and front-end developers I don't have a lot of suits in my team I have a couple of um, of what we call T-shaped generalist juniors with a specialist in one area but can do a lot of stuff um, I have a PR agency because I think it's useful to have that black book but everything else is, is done in-house including media buying um, and creative sign-off so we when we created our TV ad um, we did that ourselves we shot it ourselves we've got a crew in 
Um, I signed it off through Clearcast um, directly. We bought the, the media directly as well. Um, it works incredibly well for us. It is very hard to do. I think you have to be set up that way and really empower your teams to do it and have the right people. And we were lucky enough. I actually inherited a lot of Greg, um, of, of people Greg worked with before. So we have a fabulous creative director in house who Greg worked with for years, who is, you know, fabulous designer, UX, you know, writes a bit of code, directs things, all kinds of things. So it's it, it, either way works. I think people will always try moving in. But I, say, I think it is. I think it is hard when you're established to to make that big change. Yeah, and I guess you know you're 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 a, an organisation of a of a pretty sizable organisation. It's great that you, you you've got that kind of that depth and breadth of, of people that you can you can drop on. For smaller yeah. businesses that are still kind of going through that growth period, that they, they, they can't they, you know they, they can't have that, that that volume of people. I guess they're going to have to have some kind of hybrid model that they're, that they're, they're going to have to bring in those, those that expertise from from somewhere else to support their in-house teams to a certain degree until they get it to the level they're happy with. Well, we kind of, I mean, we've always, we have a very small team. Um, so I think excluding developers, I think I've got kind of eight or nine um, in my team. Um, so we've got, you know, a thousand employees in our organization, nearly two million customers. And actually eight feels like kind of eight, eight or nine for that. So, you know, kind of four designers, a um, couple of writers, one who did social, um, you know, it's very, it's very, very lean. And I think, you know, and actually at the beginning uh, up to kind of half a million customers, we had kind of three really had a couple of designers and, uh, you know, um, you know, who could write um, and a developer as well. So I think, I don't think you need to at the beginning bring in, in agencies I think actually maybe when you get bigger it's easier to I would say at the beginning try and do you know find a brilliant creative person who gets customers who's got some skills um, and and bring them on board I think that's where I'd start Can I, just a quick thought from you I mean I think the um, uh, interesting bit for me is companies make decisions driven by cost and in this area that's the I think it's the wrong driver um, agility and deep connection are what are important so, you know, what works incredibly well with our marketing function is that, for example, our creative director also reads customer emails every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it, it, what it means is you don't have someone writing a brief and getting it signed off by a bunch of people who then pass. And, and that very long chain that goes up and down all the time, it, it, it basically destroys the, the signal of what, what's really going on. Yeah. It also takes so much time, but by the time you've got it done, you've all wasted, you've wasted 100 human hours to achieve 10 hours of work, mm. and the world's moved. So I think um, that agility for me is, is, is prime. Agility and connection are prime over cost-driven, although by the way, it can be helpful for that. But I think the other one is then having a very high-trust organization. So I think, Rebecca, the last thing, I'm conscious of, we'll run massively over time, it might be interesting to people, is just uh, that first conversation we had about sign-off. And by we're not blasé about it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I, I said, who, who signs off this, the, you know, this email that I've written? Um, where, where's the lawyer? And Greg was like, "Don't lawyer, you sign off. You're the marketing director. If, if, if you're, if you're not grown up enough to send something out to customers um, that you're, you're not happy with, you shouldn't be here." And that's totally right. Totally right. That I know, you know, as, as a human, what's good? I know what's legal. I know what's regulatory. I've read, read the license conditions. Um, you know, I, I, I know my job, I know my craft. Um, and yeah, we do have, we do now have a lawyer. And if I'm just, you know, a little bit want to just double check something, I'll go and be like, can you double check that? But it's certainly not. I mean, uh, again, at, at um, well, name the name, but my previous employers, there was a huge, huge amount of people signing off, you know, legal and regs and data protection and operations and PR and process and customer service. And you just like, you put something beautiful into the mix and then it would just get carved away. Yeah. Um, by all these sign-offs or you'd write something that would go through sign-off which is kind of like what's the point so you know it's, it's hard because a lot of a lot of accountability because it's like it's, you know it's on it's on your your neck if it goes out but all of my team do that so my team you know will don't even necessarily need to get it signed something signed off by me you know they they know that if they put something out there that it's their responsibility to make sure that it's it's right and it's fair so which is so much better than the old png as a junior brand manager or even worse than assistant brand manager your job was to get stuff signed off not to create great stuff. And um, I think the, uh, it meant that no one had ownership because everyone's like, oh, well, I got signed by legal. You know? <laughs> so if you've got a clear cast complaint, well, not my problem. You know? And I think, as Rebecca says, when, it, when it's on you, you actually do uh, more compliant, more customer-centric, and more creative stuff with 10 times less work. Yeah. A brilliant discussion. And thank you, Steve, for, for joining us on, on that. And I think 
what we've seen today from you both is, and I can see from the comments and, and people messaging me separately as well, it is incredibly inspiring to see what can be done and what a difference it makes in terms of speed and energy to have that customer focus all the way through and to make sure that what marketing is doing is joining things up and making it work. And there's a lot in there about what you've done from a culture point of view. So some, some great takeaways, I think, as well. For those people who are still here, we're just about to do a very quick poll on the screen because we want to know whether there's a smiley face for these guys or not. I hope you found the webinar excellent, which I certainly did. It's been so nice speaking to you both. I've got about 25 million different questions I want to ask, and I know that everybody listening will want to ask as well. We will summarize all these points and share them with everybody who joined us today. Um, and I would like to say a massive thank you to Rebecca and, and Greg who are just a joy to talk to and an inspiration to anybody in marketing and fast-moving business. Everybody's listening. There are some great things coming up as well. This isn't the end of uh, brilliant things for the Marketing Society. We have got coming up on the 13th of October the launch of a new series called Community Collaborate which is for our members in APAC and Dubai and a chance for you to talk and have conversations with other people. Two other things I want to mention before we go, please make sure in your diary you have the 4th of November, which is our famous annual conference, which this year is a big get together, which is being done virtually and is going to be outstanding. And I'd love you to join us for that. You can also join us for a bit of celebration and fun and connections on the 25th of November which is Celebrations, Connections and Conversations from 6 to 8. It's going to be a fantastic evening. Both those things can be bought as tickets together, but they're an opportunity for us to bring everybody together at a time when everybody's feeling slightly apart. Any more feedback, come and find me. I also, like these two, love hearing from people. Email me, connect on LinkedIn, come and tell us what you thought. And Greg and Rebecca, thank you for your energy, for your inspiration and your honesty today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. See you, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.